So um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, I hope you're all keeping well um, at home. I appreciate it's a beautiful sunny day outside, or at least it is here in Bristol for me. Um, and I'll try not to keep you too long. Um, I'm sure it's a very thrilling topic um, that you want to all hear about uh, vicarious liability uh, on such a beautiful sunny day. Um, but um, hopefully I, it will be um, interesting. Um, mainly, I'm going to be talking to you about the two recent Supreme Court decisions in the Morrison's case and the Barclays Bank case, and what the, both of those decisions mean for uh, vicarious liability as things currently stand, which is why I've titled this talk, um, Where Are We Now? or Supreme Court uh, to the Rescue. Uh, some of you might have attended my talk last year on vicarious liability. Uh, and unfortunately, the main theme of that was that it's all doom and gloom for defendants. Um, I think, given the stance that the Supreme Court has now taken, I think my conclusion is going to be, spoiler, spoiler alert, that um, it's not quite all so doom and gloom anymore. Things are looking a bit better and perhaps a bit more settled uh, from the perspective of uh, the courts. So, um, Two key elements, of course, if you're trying to establish vicarious liability on the part of an employer. Uh, question one, is there a relationship between the tort visa and the employer that makes it proper for the law to make one pay for the fault of another? Uh, and you can call that, um, subtitle that question, uh, employee or not, or independent contractor or not. Uh, and then question two, is there a sufficient connection between that relationship and the tort fees wrongdoing? So um, I'm grateful to Adrian for this particular subtitle, but let's call that section work or frolic. Um, and those are the tests as they have been for a very long time. And what I hope you will see over the course of this talk is that while in the last few years it may look like uh, those tests have been considerably eroded uh, by the courts, uh, the, the intention of the Supreme Court in both the Morrison's and the Barclays decision appears to be uh, to try and settle matters, um, at least for now, which is why um, these two points that I've got here are in fact um, in the first paragraph of Lady Hale's judgment, the leading judgment in the in the Barclays Bank decision. And she goes on to ask, well, um, if the law of vicarious liability is moving, the question now is, how far has it moved? Um, and perhaps by the end of this talk, you, you'll have an answer. Um, I don't know how reassuring an answer it'll be, but um, but we'll, we'll try our best. So Historically, then, uh, I won't spend too long on these uh, because these are cases that you are that we're all familiar with um, now. But there's been a relate. There's, there's been a real emphasis on the question of whether there is a true re relationship of employment between the employer and the tort fees, and it used to be phrased in a lot of the older cases along the lines of master servant. Uh, relationship. Uh, then there came a line of cases uh, put using uh, employment law language along the lines of, is this person under a contract of service or a contract for services? Uh, and then finally, we had a chain of cases um, in more recent times, if I can call them the, the, the sexual abuse cases, as it were, uh, uh, one, of, and the, one of the key ones is uh, E in English province which use the term quasi-employee. Um, uh, very briefly, E in English province, again, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, but um, that involved a Roman Catholic diocese who was held liable for the negligent acts of a priest that it appointed uh, on the basis that there was a close enough relationship between the, the tort fees and, um, and the diocese itself. And those features were in favour of potential liability. And then in terms of the second question that I asked, so was the tort fees 
acting in the course of his employment when he committed the tortious act, or was he on a frolic of his own? Uh, again, we're all familiar with the case of Lister and Hesley Hall. That was another sexual abuse case by the warden of a school boarding house. And in that case, again, what was found significant was that um, a broad approach should be adopted when considering the scope of his employment. That's what Lord Clyde said. Uh, they needed to consider that uh, the employment was what provided with the tort visa with the opportunity of being present at a particular premises. So, so the reason the warden was there and able to, to commit the acts that he did was uh, because of the opportunity provided to him by the employer. And um, on that basis, of course, the close connection test there was uh, framed and that appears to have been the the, the test um, from then on, but um, subsequent cases may have eroded it somewhat um, and we'll see where we've got to now. So a few key cases that I do want to go through before I come on to the um, the recent Supreme Court decisions in Morrison's and Barclays. Um, and, and what I've done, because there's so much interesting case law um, on, on this subject. So I focused on the cases that the Supreme Court considered important. Um, so they went through, um, and both the judgments make for very interesting reading, by the way, if, you're, if you've got a few hours to spare, or if you're thinking, um, you know, I, I really would like to sit and just read some Supreme Court decisions from scratch, uh, they make for, 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 good, for good reading. But the courts went through in both those decisions and uh, set out uh, the history, perhaps, and, and the key cases as they considered them to be. So I've I've taken the same approach, um, as it were. And, and I think the, the one of the most important cases to, to touch on is, is the Christian Brothers case, uh, which, again, um, everyone is, is reasonably familiar with. But this in this case, Lord Phillips set out um, again, he, he did an analysis of, of the previous case law, but he set out then what he considered to be the two stages of the test for vicarious liability. And again, I've, I've highlighted them in red and you will see that hopefully they link back quite neatly. If you compare these two stages, they link back quite neatly to the two questions that um, I posed on my on my first slide, um, the two key parts of of the test. So uh, Lord Phillips uh, did exactly the same thing. He said the first stage is to consider the relationship of uh, D1 and D2 to see whether it is one that is capable of giving rise to vicarious liability. And then what is critical at the second stage is the connection that links the relationship between D1 and D2 and the act or omission of D1, hence the synthesis of the two stages. So, so is there a close enough connection effectively between that relationship and the act that's been complained of? But Lord Phillips went on to say that while there is usually no difficulty in identifying a number of policy reasons that usually make it fair, just and reasonable to impose vicarious liability, on the employer when these criteria are satisfied. Um, now I've highlighted that in red because that is something that the Supreme Court this year have, have focused on. So we've got here what I can call um, the five policy considerations and I've put them out there for you in full. Uh, so considerations, uh, if I can call them perhaps social justice and, and similar policy considerations, the fact that the employer is more likely to have the means to compensate and can be expected to have insured against that liability, uh, the fact that uh, the activity was being undertaken by the employee on behalf of the employer and, and, and that's what led to the tort being committed. Uh, the employer's like activity is likely to be part of the business activity of the employer. The employer um, will have created the risk and then uh, the employee will to a greater or lesser degree have been under the control of the employer. Now the reason I've put these five policy considerations up on here is that a number of subsequent cases, unfortunately, I don't have time to, to go into the details of all of the subsequent cases, but quite a few later cases have focused on these policy criteria to find that uh, that there was uh, liability or that liability ought to be imposed on the employer, even though 
perhaps if we go back to this test uh, from from Lord to Lives, a two part test, even some of some of that test may not necessarily be strictly speaking satisfied. So a lot of courts seem to have used um, these policy criteria in order to justify the imposition of liability uh, when perhaps they shouldn't have been doing that. And the reason that's important is because the Supreme Court in Barclays and Morrison's were very critical of judges uh, following that approach, uh, as we will see. So we had the Christian Brothers test. Uh, I, I won't call it test. We have the Christian Brothers decision with these uh, policy criteria set out in there. And then come along a string of other cases. Uh, and as I said, I, I'm only focusing on the ones that the Supreme Court have uh, quoted at some length uh, in their more recent decisions. But we come on to perhaps one of the more difficult cases uh, in the last few years, which is Mohammed and uh, Morrison supermarkets. Um, I think Morrison's have, have qu had quite an unfortunate run um, in, in vicarious liability cases. Um, I don't know if they're, they're pleased about that or not, but um, certainly this is one of the two main Supreme Court cases in which Morrison's um, feature. Uh, this one involved um, a petrol station employee of Morrison's uh, called Mr Khan or Kay who seriously assaulted a customer at the petrol station. Um, he ignored instructions from his supervisor who actually came on the scene and tried to stop him and um, what the key issue there that the court considered was was there a sufficient connection between the uh, tort visa's employment and his conduct towards the claimant to justify holding Morrison's vicariously liable. Um, at trial, it was found that there was no vicarious liability due to the lack of a sufficiently close connection between the um, between Mr Khan's employment and the tortious conduct that was complained of. So, so the second limb of, of that test that we looked at earlier on, the Lister close connection test, uh, and then Court of Appeal again um, dismissed the appeal. And they took the view that um, Mr Khan's duties were very much circumscri circumscribed. He was not given any duties that involved a clear possibility of confrontation or placed in a situation where an outbreak of violence was likely. Um, the fact that his employment involved interaction with customers was not on its own enough to make his employers liable for his use of violence towards the claimant. Um, so sensible on the face of it. But then the Supreme Court came along and they didn't agree. They decided, uh, and um, I've quoted from Lord Toulson here, that his conduct was inexcusable, but it was within the field of activities assigned to him. And therefore, what happened thereafter was an unbroken sequence of events. And there was an argument made on behalf of um, the defendant that uh, Mr. Khan had metaphorically taken off his uniform the moment he stepped from behind that counter. Uh, and that argument was, was rejected by the Supreme Court. They said, actually, this was a seamless episode. Uh, and they also pointed out that uh, when Mr. Khan followed the claimant back to his car and opened the front passenger door, he again told the claimant in threatening words is never to come back to the petrol station. This was not something personal between them. Uh, he was purporting to act about his employer's business. Now, I've highlighted a few bits here in red. Um, I'm going to come back to those again, because what I've highlighted in red, those few phrases, field of activities, unbroken sequence of events, seamless episode, they are all phrases that the Supreme Court later on this year in, in Barclays and Morrison's have, have considered to be um, very important. Um, what is worth thinking about, however, with, with Mohammed is that that little fact that Mr. Khan's supervisor was telling him to, to, to stop and was trying to intervene, uh, but um, he still he still carried on. Uh, and nevertheless, it was held that he was still purporting uh, to act about his employer's business uh, and what Lord Tolson went on to say 
was that while this was a gross abuse of uh, Mr Khan's position, it was in connection with the business in which he was employed to serve customers. Uh, and his motive is irrelevant. It looks obvious that he was motivated by personal racism rather than a desire to benefit his employer's business. That is neither here nor there. Um, I'm so sorry, I think someone has joined us who hasn't muted their microphone because I can hear some feedback. Thank you very much. That That's great. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm focusing on motive here because, again, this, this will become very important when we look at um, what the, the Supreme Court has now said. But in Muhammad, the Supreme Court appeared to be saying that the fact that he might have been racist and that was that was his reason for attacking this customer um, was was irrelevant, given that he was still serving customers and he's effectively gone from inside um, the shop serving someone to following him out onto the floor, um, onto the forecourt um, and then attacking him. Uh, and it's all one seamless chain of events. And therefore, uh, the conclusion was that he acted in connection with the business in which he was employed to serve customers um, and applying Lister, Supreme Court said, there was vicarious liability there. And we then come on to Arms and Nottinghamshire County Council, which um, again, it raises tricky questions um, in terms of uh, the, the first part of, of that test. So that the relationship between, was there actually a relationship of employer-employee or akin to employer-employee? Uh, this involved a child who'd been sexually abused by foster parents with whom she'd been placed while in the care of the defendant local authority. A uh, question there was, was the local authority vicariously liable for the wrongdoing of foster parents? Supreme Court said, again, um, that it was on the basis that um, there was a relationship uh, between the activity of the foster parents and the local authority. They weren't carrying out an independent business of their own. Their activity was part of the local authority's business activity and which was giving a benefit of, to that authority. And now that next bullet point, um, that is where those policy considerations that that were set out in in the Christian Brothers case come into play that the inherent risk of abuse when being placed into care should be borne by the authority and the authority exercised a significant degree of control over both uh, what the foster parents did and how and uh, we've got Lord Reed again um, and let's remember what he says here and compare it to what he goes on to say this year in um, in Barclays and Morrison's. But Lord Reed um, again emphasised uh, those sorts of considerations that uh, it's impossible to draw a sharp line between the activity of the local authority who are responsible for the care of the child and the and the promotion of her welfare and that of the foster parents whom they recruited and trained and with whom they placed the child. Uh, and he gives the example that there are countless cases where vicarious liability has been imposed for torts committed by professional persons who carry out their work without close supervision. So as far as that first question is concerned, that of the employer-employee relationship, um, he seemed to be suggesting that um, supervision in and of itself is, is not a particularly key criterion anymore. And then there's a real emphasis in the judgment, again, to the lack of any other source of compensation if uh, there was a finding of no vicarious liability made. Um, and they talked a bit about uh, the interplay between non-delegable duties and vicarious liability. Um, the Supreme Court considered arms in Barclays uh, they weren't entirely happy about it, but um, they concluded that this is perhaps the most difficult case as far as the line of cases preceding uh, this year's decision was concerned. Uh, but um, as far as the Supreme Court is concerned, arms is as it is. Uh, and they, ha they, they, they haven't uh, explicitly said that um, in this sort of scenario, liability won't be imposed. Um, but that it's simply it's difficult and it doesn't fit very easily with with the tests as we as we see them. And then I'll come on briefly to Bellman. Again, you can see this this chronological progression of cases. So we're up to 2018. 
Um, this one was was relatively high profile case involved a managing director who had assaulted um, a an employee at a Christmas party uh, that the company was organising. Um, in fact, they'd moved on by this point to the after party stage. Um, he'd encouraged people to move on. He was organising it. He was paying for things. Um, and he was overseeing the smooth running of the party, as it were. So he wasn't just another attendee. And he appeared to have been having a conversation with um, a number of employees uh, in which the employee who was assaulted touched upon a recruitment decision that the MD had recently made. Um, this appears to have triggered the MD into perhaps thinking that his authority was being challenged. And um, he assaulted this employee unprovoked uh, and caused him some uh, some serious injury. And what the Court of Appeal found was that there was a sufficient connection between the MD's role and the assault. So at the time that it happened, notwithstanding that the assault didn't happen on uh, the company's premises um, and it didn't even happen at the official Christmas party, it happened at the after party, he'd still been wearing his MD hat. Uh, and what Lady Justice Asplin focused on was um, the fact that the attack arose out of a misuse of the position entrusted to Mr Major as managing director. So on that basis, uh, liability was uh, found on the part of the employer. Um, and we now come on, finally, I've had to skip out a few more interesting cases in between, but we come on to um, Barclays Bank this year and what the Supreme Court uh, decided in that case. Now, the facts of this, uh, again, apologies to those who are already familiar with them, I've put them up there on the screen for you in the slide. Uh, it was a number of claimants seeking damages against the defendant Barclays in respect of sexual assaults to which they had been subjected by a doctor, Dr Bates, uh, between 1968 and 1984. Um, the majority of the claimants were uh, applicants for, were new applicants for jobs with, with Barclays. A small number were existing employees and Barclays mandated that they attend the home of Dr. Bates for a medical examination on Barclays' behalf um, and before their, their applications could be considered any further. And when they did so, Dr. Bates uh, sexually assaulted uh, each of them in the process. He then died in 2009 um, and a police inquiry investigated a very large number of um, the, the, the claims concluded that there would have been sufficient evidence to pursue a prosecution if he had been alive. Uh, and by that point, uh, unfortunately, his estate had also been dissipated, etc. So, so there was there was not much point the claimants bringing uh, a claim against uh, the estate at that point. So what we had was a trial of a preliminary issue. Was the defendant Barclays? vicariously liable for any assaults that uh, Dr Bates may have perpetrated in the course of medical examinations carried out at Barclays's request, either before they began their employment or while they were already employed. Now, the lower courts, uh, both in the High Court and the Court of Appeal, held that the defendant was vicariously liable. And this was then overturned by the Supreme Court, who decided the opposite. Uh, and you can, you can see there, uh, I've set out very briefly what the High Court's reasoning was, and we'll see what the Supreme Court made of it. Uh, so number of five points, essentially, uh, that were found to be key uh, in the High Court, uh, set them out there. Um, I've highlighted the first one in red, because as you can see, it's that policy consideration popping up again, as one of the most important factors that Miss Dr. Bates is deceased, and therefore the only possible thing that the claimants can do uh, is uh, bring the claim against Barclays, who did have the means to meet their claims. 
And as the defendant had made the arrangements for the exams, the claimants had no reason to be examined by Dr. Bates other than through the defendant's request. Therefore, he was acting for the benefit of the defendant. And the purpose of the exams was to enable Barclays to be satisfied that um, any particular applicant uh, would be an effective member of the workforce. So, so it was integral to their business activity. Uh, and it also focused on um, the, the level of control exercised by the defendant um, Barclays on each claimant who was being told where to go and so on and so forth. So, so the risk was was being created by Barclays' actions. Um, and just because Dr. Bates might have been doing other medical roles um, at other times didn't change the fact that when he was doing this role, he was under defendant's control. Uh, and then there's the issue of physical proximity. Uh, the Court of Appeal upheld the decision um, on appeal. Um, what I've set out here is actually what I think is a very um, key part of uh, the reasoning of the Court of Appeal, which um, the Supreme Court did not like at all. So we have Lord Justice Irwin in the, in the Court of Appeal pointing out that uh, no doubt where the answers to the Cox Muhammad questions are such that vicarious liability cannot be established, the relationship may often be that of an independent contractor. So the Court of Appeal appeared to be taking um, the recent Supreme Court decisions um, as very much eroding the, the line between employees and independent contractors and pointing out that just because why was Dr. Bates not insured? There's a question by Douglas. Why was Dr. Bates not insured as a doctor, CICA? Um, I have a feeling, um, Douglas, I need to go back and review the case, but I think the issue, as far as insurance was concerned, is that insurance doesn't normally cover intentional um, acts of that kind. Um, there isn't a huge amount of reference within the decision itself to the insurance provision, but Essentially, it made more financial sense for um, for the claimants to bring this claim on mass against um, the against Barclays rather than Dr. Bates uh, overall. Um, yes, yeah, so Lord Justice Erwin focused on the fact that while well, ease of business doesn't displace or circumvent the principles now established by the Supreme Court, and Again, this, this paragraph sets out uh, the Supreme Court's view on this. Now, I've quoted it in full because, in fact, if you go and read the Barclays decision, it's, it's not a very long decision, but this is the only paragraph in it in which they properly apply, in my view, the, the, the reasoning that they've set out um, to the facts of this case. So, effectively, they decided that Dr. Bates was an independent contractor and therefore um, there was no vicarious liability. So they've so the key points there that he was at no point was he an employee of the bank. Uh, he wasn't anything close to an employee. Um, he while he while he made while he did the examinations as uh, the bank wanted him to do, um, Lady Hale said, well, the same could be true of many other people who worked for the bank but were clearly independent contractors, such as the company hired to clean windows, to auditors hired to audit its books. And um, he wasn't paid a retainer of any kind. He had got a fee per report. He could refuse any examinations that he wanted to. And he was very much in business on his own account as a medical practitioner with a portfolio of patients and clients. And just one of those clients was the bank. So for all of those reasons, the Supreme Court decided that um, Dr. Bates wasn't um, it wasn't an employee or wasn't akin to an employee and no vicarious liability um, follows. But what is almost more interesting about the decision, um, if you can bear with me, is the comments by the Supreme Court about the cases that follow. So effectively, what we've now got is the um, the Supreme Court's views on how we should look back at and interpret some of those older cases um, that I've talked about. So, so they confirmed that the Christian Brothers case um, is still relevant, but they see it as saying nothing unconventional 
at all. And uh, what um, the Supreme Court was was very critical of uh, in in their decision, Lady Hale uh, was was quite scathing, and she said, "Well, there appears to have been a tendency to um, elide the policy reasons for the doctrine of the employer's liability for the acts of his employee." So, with the principles which should guide the development of that liability into relationships which are not employment, which are sufficiently in akin to employment to make it fair and just to impose such liability. And they also confirmed what Lord what, what Lord Sumption said in Woodland uh, on non-delegable duties, which unfortunately this talk, there is no scope in this talk to cover the, 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 the whole um, area of law, non-delegable duties, but we'll leave that for a future talk. But uh, Lord Sumption in Woodland pointed out that vicarious liability has never extended to the negligence of those who are truly independent contractors. And Lady Hale um, and the Supreme Court as a whole confirmed that principle, that, it, that the fact remains that if you are truly an independent contractor, then um, by care, then the employer, um, well, you can't call them employer, but the company for whom you are undertaking that work um, will not be held vicariously liable for you. And what Lady Hill commented was that those five uh, policy reasons that I went through uh, in the Christian Brothers case earlier might be helpful. Um, she said no more than may be helpful, but only in doubtful cases. So the approach now very much appears to be that um, where there is perhaps real ambiguity over the employer-employee relationship, then perhaps those policy reasons might swing the balance towards the court making the finding that, um, that a particular employer ought to be liable uh, for the acts of, um, of the tort visa. But um, otherwise, you, you still really do need to be jumping through the hoops uh, and establishing as, as a claimant that um, that you, you fulfill the criteria that there is a relationship akin to employment there. Now, what was interesting um, on the part of the Supreme Court is that they did look at the definition of worker under the Employment Rights Act. And, and, and she pointed out that, Lady Hill, that um, there, there are two subcategories there um, in terms of those who are definitely workers under a contract of employment so that they get full protection under the Employment Rights Act. And then there are some who are entitled to some protection uh, under the ERA. Uh, so they fall somewhere between full employment and um, being a true independent contractor. But, but she said, well, actually, it might be helpful to ask that question uh, in order to work out whether or not someone is a a true independent contact contractor but uh, she said we need to resist the urge to, to excessive tidiness as it were uh, by saying that, you know that, that just because employment law says that someone um, is not an independent contractor doesn't mean that um, that uh, tort law is going to say the same and, and vice versa so um, we, we shouldn't we should be very slow to try and say that um, just because uh, one applies and then so the other does so we very much keeping those two concepts uh, separate. But yes, yeah, so what the Supreme Court has confirmed as far as the that, that first limb of the test is concerned, um, that this is all very conventional, that the question is, as it has always been, whether the tort visa is carrying on business on his own account or whether he is in a relationship akin to employment with the defendant um, and where it's clear that the tort visa is carrying on his own independent business, it is not necessary to consider the five incidents of those five policy reasons. And you can see why that um, the, the case of arms that I mentioned earlier uh, involving the, the, the Foster family sits uncomfortably perhaps with, with that definition and why Lady Hale call it a, a very difficult case. But but nevertheless, I think they accepted grudgingly that, that there would be those situations um, in which uh, liability has been established uh, for, for a number of reasons. And then we come on then to, to, to Morrison's. Um, again, poor old Morrison's um, facing um, another claim by a number of uh, people because uh, they had an employee 
with a grudge, uh, Mr Skelton, who decided to upload the payroll data of 100,000 employees to a file sharing website and sent it to a number of newspapers who very much chose, thankfully, not to publish that information. And um, he was subsequently uh, reported and uh, convicted. The Court of Appeal upheld the trial judge's finding that there had been a close connection between the tortious acts that he did and his role. So he'd been asked to provide information about payroll uh, to their auditors. So he had, he received the payroll information for that reason. Um, and um, he um, he had that information only because he was carrying out that role. And as part of that continuous sequence of events, that's the wording taken from the Muhammad case that we looked at earlier. Uh, therefore, the uh, therefore Morrisons were vicariously liable for him. The Supreme Court, however, disagreed and found that there was no vicarious liability there. And now I've quoted here a paragraph from the Court of Appeal decision uh, because, again, you, what you see is the Supreme Court being very scathing of the same um, concerns. Um, the Court of Appeal had said, well, look, if this is an issue here, um, given that there are there are data breaches, there have been lots of instances of data breaches in, 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 in the last few years. Um, but the solution, if you're a defendant, is to ensure against those catastrophes. And the fact that uh, that a defendant is insured is not in its, on its own a reason for imposing liability, but the availability of that insurance is a valid answer to the doomsday of Armageddon arguments put forward um, on behalf of the, of the poor defendants. Um, the Supreme Court did not like this at all. And they've pointed out, and I suspect much to the relief of um, of defendants and of insurers that Muhammad was not intended to change the law of vicarious liability, but rather to follow existing precedents. Um, and they were very critical of the lower courts uh, in this matter and pointed out that they thought they'd misunderstood the principles. And the online disclosure was not part of Mr. Skelton's field of activities. He wasn't authorised to do it. The Christian Brothers principles came into play when it comes to employer tort visa relationship, which in this case, of course, was not in doubt. He definitely was an employee, but weren't relevant to the close connection test. And just because there was a temporal or causal connection um, doesn't alone satisfy the close connection test. Uh, and the question of motive was highly material. So was Mr. Skelton acting on his employer's business or was he doing this for purely personal reasons? Now, I've put that in there because remember the quote that I put up from Muhammad earlier, which said motive is irrelevant. Um, what Lord Reed said was actually, don't take that phrase out of context. Um, and motive is very much relevant. Uh, and they went back to uh, the case of Dubai, aluminium and Salam. And I've quoted the, the most important paragraph from that here, uh, which was endorsed by the Supreme Court um, in, in this case, that perhaps the best general answer is that the wrongful conduct must be so closely connected with acts the partner or employee was authorised to do that for the purposes of the liability of the firm or employer to third parties, the wrongful conduct may fairly and properly be regarded as done by the partner while acting in the ordinary course of the firm's business or the employees or the employee's employment. So confirming that um, test, uh, note that this is a much older iteration, as it were, of that test, uh, because, of course, it predates um, all of the, the subsequent cases that we've looked at that perhaps eroded uh, the close connection test um, somewhat. And not only did they go back to um, to the Dubai aluminium decision, but they also brought back and confirmed um, that old phrase that we've all seen in, in taught textbooks uh, from time immemorial, um, 
frolic of his own. And I say they went back to it because they quoted um, they quoted from the case of Joel and Morrison, which is um, oh, another Morrison, but it's from 1834. Supreme Court quoted from Joel and Morrison and confirmed that um, that phrase remained relevant. Um, the, the paragraph that they quoted, I'll read it out to you. Um, the master is only liable where the servant is acting in the course of his employment. If he was going out of his way against his master's implied commands when driving on his master's business, he will make his master liable. But if he was going on a frolic of his own without being all on his master's business, without being at all on his master's business, the master will not be liable. The Supreme Court in 2020 gone back to the 1834 decision and confirmed that um, that phrase remains relevant and, and we will still need to ask ourselves, um, was this employee off or was this person off on a frolic of their own? And they emphasise, as far as Dubai Aluminium is concerned, that courts need to distinguish between cases where an employee is engaged, however misguidedly, in furthering his employee's business, where there will be vicarious liability, and cases where the employee is engaged solely in pursuing his own interests or often a frolic of his own when there'll be no vicarious liability. And they explained Bellman, uh, the case, remember, with the, with the MD who, who assaulted drunkenly an employee at the Christmas party, as a case where this was not an act entirely of personal vengeance. So the fact that he was still lashing out in the context of his authority as MD being challenged meant that that was not an act of personal vengeance entirely. And therefore, um, it, it sort of fits in with how the, how the Supreme Court um, have interpreted um, that, uh, that test. Um, where the sexual abuse cases are concerned, um, they they pointed out that, strictly speaking, those cases cannot be regarded as something done by the employee while acting in the ordinary course of his employment. But instead, the courts have emphasised the importance of criteria that, that are particularly relevant, such as the employer's conferral of authority on the employee over the victims which he has abused. So, so there appears to be recognition there that those cases sort of sit apart on their own. But because there's been an established um, principle now from the court that um, the victims were put in that position um, simply because a, a particular employer conferred that authority onto the, the tort visa, um, that's why they still come under the vicarious liability uh, bracket. Uh, but um, it's perhaps refreshing that the Supreme Court's recognised that uh, those cases don't really sit neatly with the established tests for vicarious liability. But they were at pains to point out that what they were talking about was very much a return to orthodox common law reasoning, um, going so far as to, to um, exercise a note of caution to judges everywhere that vicarious liability is not determined according to individual judges' sense of social justice, but decided by orthodox common law reasoning, generally based on the application to the case before the court of the principle set out um, in Dubai Aluminium in light of the guidance to be decide, to be derived from decided cases. And uh, in some cases, the answer might be clear, but in others, inevitably, a finer judgment um, will be called for. So my takeaway from this is that the close connection test now remains firmly in place and perhaps looking a lot narrower than we thought it was um, before uh, these two decisions came out. Um, my own personal view, I still think there's a bit of tension between um, cases like Bellman and Muhammad, where you have a physical um, or assault by, by someone and the Supreme Court's analysis of Mr. Skelton's actions in, in Morrison's. I mean, arguably from the perspective of both the employers in, in Bellman and uh, Muhammad, they would say that both of those individuals acted in a personal conflict situation and mo motivated by personal vengeance um, or, or ego or, or racism rather than 
um, acting in the course of, of their employer's um, employment. Um, certainly in the case of Mr Khan, where he's got a supervisor there trying to get him to stop uh, the, the, the assault. Um, so arguably, if you look at the ordinary meaning of the phrase, often a frolic of their own, it, it's difficult to see how Mr Khan and, and um, the managing director in, in Bellman didn't uh, tick that box of being often a frolic of their own. But perhaps you can reconcile that tension by focusing on the, the phrase seamless chain of events, uh, which the Supreme Court also latched on to um, in, uh, in Morrison's, and then they endorsed that phrase from, from Ham Muhammad. So I think things are still going to be very fact-specific, um, which, is, which is worth remembering. But I hope that defendants and insurers will perhaps draw some comfort from these decisions on the basis that they should discourage courts uh, in, in many instances from simply resorting to policy considerations when <coughs> the test, strictly speaking, is not um, satisfied. Um, some of you might have attended um, a talk I did last year, obviously predating the Supreme Court decisions, in which I quoted uh, Lord Dyson and put um, in Mohammed um, pointing out that this is an area in which imprecision is inevitable and to search for certainty and precision in vicarious liability is to undertake a quest for a chimera. Um, now, I guess the question I would I want to leave you with is today, have we now found the chimera or if you believe the Supreme Court as of 2020, is there no chimera to be found at all because we are completely established, nothing new under the sun? Um, I said at the beginning that Lady Hill posed the question um, that the law of vicarious liability is on the move, but we need to find out how far that move can take it. Um, if you accept the Supreme Court now, um, then it's not on the move at all. And it's we're back in 1834, um, still looking at whether someone's been on a frolic of their own. So um, there we have it. Um, was there a chimera to be found at all? Have we found it? I will leave that uh, for you to, to think about. And, and I will open up um, to questions. Um, I can see there's a comment there by Tony Redford uh, saying he received a reserve judgment this morning where the judge looked at the very moment when the tort occurred and asked if the employee was on his employer's business at that point in time. The fact that the factual background may have some relation to his employer's business is not determinative. Um, oh, that's very interesting. Um, so, Tony, I, can some, I, I can shed some further light if you want. Yes, please, Tony. I was just so, about to ask you to do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. so um, the, the, the person committing the assault was the branch manager of a business. And um, there is no doubt that the connection between the person he assaulted and him was strictly personal. Um, but what happened was that the person he assaulted turned up at his place of work and the employee assaulted him while he was at his place of work during his hours of work. Um, uh, and there was quite, we looked quite closely at the cases where what might start off as something in the course of the employer's business and then becomes not in the course of the employer's business. Um, one of the, uh, it's not Muhammad, it's the other, uh, I think it's the other assault uh, case in a garage, the name of which escapes me for the moment. Um, but the point was made that simply because an a sequence of events starts as part of the employer's business doesn't mean that by the time the actual tort occurs, it will inevitably uh, still be within the uh, course of the employer's business. Uh, and uh, it can be vice versa. I suppose Bellman was an example of vice versa, where it started off not in the course of the employer's business, because when they were all getting drunk at the Christmas party, everyone agreed that wasn't in the course of the employer's business. Yeah. But because the managing director called them all together to exert his authority at the end of the Christmas party, that that it, it, that returned to it being in the course of the employer's business. And in my case, it was the opposite. Um, you know, something that uh, started um, as something personal, or sorry, it was the right way, it was the same way around, something that started as something personal, arguably became part of the employer's business. 
So I think the, the sort of the message is that um, you can't look at the whole sequence of events from beginning to end and characterize the whole thing as either being within the employer's business or a follic of their own. Mm. You have to focus on, um, and this is particularly opposite in the cases of assault, which is probably what m- most of us deal with rather than the Muhammad case, which was data breach. You, you focus on the actual moments of the tort and ask yourself, was he still on his employer's business at that time? And he may well have been up until moments before, but may have ceased to be by the time the assault was actually committed. Uh, but, but Tony, um, looking at, so I think you meant, so Morrison's is, is the data breach one, but what about yes. the older Morrison's and Muhammad, which was the employee assaulting on the, the, the petrol station grounds? Um, I would have said that that doesn't necessarily sit neatly with, with, with the approach that, that, you've just, that, that you've just described. Um, so that was the one where the, the employee leaves the inside of the shop, follows the customer out and then assaults him um, on the on the grounds of the, the petrol station while his supervisor is apparently trying to trying to stop him. So arguably under that approach, I see where you're coming from, that the, perhaps a sensible approach there would have been to say, well, he stopped um, being on his employer's business. So although it was a seamless chain of events, that chain was broken by him explicitly, I guess, disobeying uh, instructions and proceeding to assault that customer. Yeah, I'm just trying to, there, there was another case, and I'm just trying to, uh, sorry, I joined this meeting late because I had mm-hmm. not hearing, but there was, there was another case where um, the, um, the employee waited until the police, called the police, and then uh, assaulted the person um, because the person said he was going to make a complaint against him. Does that ring any bells? Yes, yes, yes. That was that was referred to within um, within the Morrison judgment. Yeah, um, right. I forget which I, case. I forget yes, which so, that was now. So but, do I. Um, sorry, go on. But 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 uh, in that case, they decided that um, because the uh, employee assaulted at the point when the person he assaulted said he was going to um, uh, bring a complaint against him, they decided that that transferred from being within the employer's business to being a frolic on his own. Mm. So um, uh, what it, I think what that shows is that um, any sequence of events can switch between being on the employer's business and being frolic mm-hmm. on a frolic of their own and back again. Mm. Uh, and that to characterise the whole thing, the sequence of events as either being one or the other, um, is unhelpful. And Bellman is a good example of that. That something that, you know, half an hour before when they were all getting drunk at the Christmas party, that wasn't on the employer's business. But by the time uh, after that there came to be an assault, um, then it was. So my, my, my point is that uh, a sequence of events can fluctuate between the two. Between the two. Yeah. You probably look at uh, the time of the actual talk rather than the whole sequence of events. And that was part of the criticism that they had in um, Muhammad, wasn't it? Was that um, they, they looked at it as part of a whole sequence rather than breaking it up into working out you know, the point at which the employee who committed the assault went beyond the employer's authority. Yes, 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 quite. Um, I've, I've got, there's another interesting question, thanks Tony, from, from Adam that I'm just going to deal with very quickly, um, in which he says, He's finding it difficult to see the descriptive difference, <coughs> excuse me, between the authority of the teacher brother in Christian Brothers and Dr. Bates, um, or doc, uh, Dr. Bates has a doctor authority over his customer, which is what allowed the events to occur. And Gabriel has responded to say Bates was truly self-employed, while the teacher was not. Um, I think that that's got to be right, isn't it? That in that in the Christian Brothers case, um, perhaps the, the issue of the employer-employee relationship uh, is not as controversial, whereas in the Dr Bates case, um, the, the issue here is that um, he is a truly an independent contractor. Um, any other comments on that from, from, from Tony or from, from anyone else who wants to contribute? I've done enough talking. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tony. Um, and there was a question earlier from Douglas uh, in respect of uh, Dr. Bates's insurance uh, and CICA. And thanks very much to Adrian um, for the response to that one. Um, he's pointed out that 
that predate the assaults predate the CICA and its predecessor, but in any event, the claimants had waited much more than two years before trying to take action. So that's simple, simple answer there, I guess, that um, they were just out of time to, to bring those claims. Are there any other questions or comments or observations on um, on vicarious liability, or is this probably about as, as clear as mud now, having um, seen what the Supreme Court have to say about it? No? Okay, I will I will assume then that there are no other questions. Um, okay, thank sorry. The, the, sorry, the other case I was referring to, I've just been rummaging through the skeleton arguments in the case where, yes. uh, the other case was called Warren and Henley's, which they do refer to in the, the latest Morrison, it's an old case, yes, but um, uh, that was a case where um, customers, so that a, a stroppy petrol station attendant was rude to a customer, customer um, called a policeman, police attended, and then uh, the customer said he was going to complain to the um, attendant's employers. And in response to that, the attendant punched the customer in the face. And um, what the Court of Appeal said in that case was that because the, the punch related to the threat of a complaint about his conduct, rather than actually the way he discharged his duties as a petrol attendant, Mm. That fell outside the employer's business. So that was so another example of how a case can fluctuate in and out of. Mm. Um, but 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 Tony, I guess that one. I mean, I've just found the reference in the decision uh, in the Supreme Court decision, um, and they weren't they weren't fans of that because they said it's unconvincing to say that the assault had no connection whatsoever with the discharge of the attendant's duties. Yeah. Its function was to deal with the employer. So they they didn't like it. So I think under. The current approach, um, they would probably have decided that the other way, I think. But then you um, would have thought that under the current approach, Bellman would probably have been decided the other way as well. Mm, you and yes. They expressly said that was correct. Um, they expressly thanks. said Bellman was um, correct <laughs> decided by the Court of um, Appeal. Yes, 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 exactly. Um, Gabs says, an excellent presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Gabriel. Uh, one final question. Could this complex area benefit from a flow chart to aid analysis? Um, Gabriel, if you would like to put a flowchart together, I will be delighted and I will very proudly add it on to this PowerPoint and display it on our website. Um, I think my current flowchart abilities perhaps uh, fall somewhat short of the um, complexity required. Um, so thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions, then I will I will leave it there. I hope you all have a um, lovely sunny um afternoon and evening um and i know we're not quite there yet one more day to go but i hope you have a very good uh, bank holiday weekend um thank you all for joining us and have a uh have a lovely afternoon bye